Okay, let's keep on going. Uh, we'll be done in an hour for lunch, right? Is lunch after me, Ken? All right, uh, let's find chest pain for a second dissection. I actually had a dissection, I've had a couple in the last couple months, I had one in my last shift. So it's sort of an easy one because this guy came in screaming in pain. There's only one thing that caused that kind of pain, that's dissection. So you gotta look for it, especially the mid-level. So, uh, you know, I won't talk about it very long, but dissection really is the only cause of acute chest, back, or abdominal pain that's sudden, severe, and can do two things. Number one, it can be migratory, because as the dissection progresses, the, the location of pain can change. Number two, you have a concomitant neurologic symptom. Why is that? It's because of the anterior spinal artery, right? Also because they're carotid, by the way. So if someone comes in with acute chest pain with a weak arm or abdominal pain with a numb leg, you think about dissection. Physical findings don't help you a whole lot because uh, like my guy the other day who had a huge dissection, his, his pulse, pulse were symmetric. There was no AI murmur because it was a type B rather than type A. But uh, really, you have to know about dissection. And if uh, you don't, talk to your medical directors and we should do some CME on it. It is uh, one of my favorite things to see and diagnose, but it's really a very, very important entity not to miss. I won't tell you about my first patient ever at the Broadview Heights Freestanding was, was a patient with type A dissection, but uh, that's another story. That's story over in the bar, not over here. Went fine, by the way. I, rem I remember type A because a is a, I remember A is ascending aorta, so I can't remember the rest of this stuff, but type A means ascending. Uh, and I don't even know what the debac debacle the classification is, but I remember Stanford because of type A. Uh, so if they have ascending aorta, that's, that goes right to the operating room. My patient had brought me right from, went from a freestanding ER right to the operating room. A case went home two weeks later. Uh, and type B, the, the setting now, is really a, uh, the treatment is really manager blood pressure. And also now they're using stents for these people. So most of these people get into vascular stents. So these people need a surgical intensive care unit and blood pressure management, but no surgery. So my guy who came in with shrieking, terrible, this guy was hypertensive in his 40s, by the way, hypertensive, strenuous stool, sun severe pain, couldn't sit. I mean, this guy had to be dissecting, and he was, but he had, a, he had type B, although it was, it was still thoracic aorta and down to his iliacs. But those people, if they're not type A, it's really blood pressure management. We basically put them asleep. We put them down, we intubated them, A-line, central line, parental, antihypertensive treatment into the SICU. And I think he did okay, but I gotta, I gotta follow up with him. Uh, but these people need blood pressure control. And uh, I do, I also have my card, I also can't remember all the causes here, so I keep a card with me, and I just go through the list. So this guy was hypertensive, which you don't forget. Other risk factors, uh, you know, stimulants like cocaine, exertion. I never remember the rest of this stuff. Uh, there was a really famous case. Actually, there, was, there were some lectures on a uh, really sad case. Uh, Jonathan Larson. Ever hear of Jonathan Larson? He's the guy who wrote the play Rent. And he ended up being Marf he ended up with Marfan. He had Marfan syndrome. No one knew that. You got somebody got a cart. You don't look at how tall they were. This guy went to the ER three times. And he died at home after it was missed three times the night before rent opened on Broadway. Really sad case, guy like 32 years old. And uh, you know, if you looked at him, he had long, you know, long limbs and he was really tall and he ended up uh, having Marfan syndrome, but no one knew it at the time. And uh, actually one paper, the people who work with us, I include a paper from the IRAD, the International Registry of Aortic Dissection. So the last paper written, I think in 2010, with 4,200 plus cases of dissection, they catalog them all. And the only uh, disappointing thing there was that in the 1980s and 90s, we thought that most of the people with a type I dissection had a wide immediate stinum. So that would be 80%, 85%. And the IRAD paper in 2010 was only 52%. So it used to be nice, you have sun sphere pain, look at a chest x-ray, oh, wide immediate stinum, you're off to the races, but only 52% had wide immediate stinum. So it makes it even harder. We won't talk about ultrasound today, but uh, uh, I keep all this stuff with me because I can't remember it all. Uh, 
so really, the physical findings, mostly the time there's nothing. Uh, but I would at least check for symmetry of pulses and uh, listen for an AI murmur and look at their vital signs. And it's always CT, uh, even if they're pregnant. And uh, if they're renal failure, get a CT. Also, you never get MRI takes too long, but you can go for MRI if you really can't get a CT. So if they're not too sick and they're 30 weeks pregnant, you might go for an MRI and you never get a, you never get a transesophageal CT in the ER. I want to go over some, some uh, patterns of EKGs because just like you really need to know stroke and sepsis, you really need to know how to interpret EKGs even as a mid-level. You don't have to, but you know, why not be good at what you do, right? It's not that hard. So really, it's patterns. So let's go through a few of these for five minutes, then we'll do our last talk here. So posterior infarction, it's usually in the presence of an inferior wall. And uh, usually, you get ST depression in leads of V1 to V4, along with an inferior wall MI. You're looking at patterns, and residents would come to me and say, what do you think about this ST, this, this T wave, or that squiggle? I said, you know, squiggles don't matter. It's patterns. So we'll talk about that. So you can get right side leads if you want. So we've got some EKGs here. They're all pretty obvious. So J point elevation in two, three, F, probably some reciprocal changes here, but deep J point depression, V2, V3, that's a posterior wall. Inferior plus this. So let's see what it says. Uh, it's posterior extension by horizontal ST depression, V1 to V3. That's the main thing. Tall, broad R waves in V2, V3. Dominant R wave in V2, upright T waves. But all you really need is the inferior leads and that. Pretty obvious. This says posterior lead placement. So besides the stuff we talked about, if you do a V789, you see ST elevation there. Uh, Antra wall infarctions, patterns. So if it's septal, V1, V2, I guess it's all, it's all in your handout. Anterior V2 to 5, anterior septal V1 to V4, anterior lateral 3, 6 plus 1 AVL. Of extensive, you get everything. So let's look at some patterns there. Who cares what the anatomy is? You know, I don't care to tell cardiologists, I think it might be a, a left circ or left main, it doesn't matter. Our job is to diagnose it. In both systems, I think, in the UH system for sure, I think Mercy did the same thing. The meds are, are easy. You give them low dose of heparin, up to 4,000 units of heparin. You give them Berlinta, uh, 180, and you give them an aspirin. And you give them a cath lab. And if you can't get them a cath lab because you're working in Andover, or a uh, doctor works in Amherst, talk to your cardiologist because they may say give TPA en route. It's going to be more than 90 minutes. You want to give TPA to them. Talk to your cardiologist. So uh, anteroceptal, let's look again. Inferior leads here look fine, but look at this. J-point elevation from here to here. So J-point elevation really prominently in V2, V3, V4. So this is really uh, anteroceptal. So ST elevation maximal in the anteroceptal leads, V1 and V4. Uh, some Q waves in V1, V2. There's also some subtle ST elevation in one AVL. So it may extend laterally. Reciprocal in, in lead three. So you can see there's ST depression over here. So that's an acute anteroceptal STEMI. Uh, example two, same patient 40, 50 minutes later. Now it's really obvious, right? They measured this before. And when you do this for a while, you look at EKG, you can make the diagnosis in nanoseconds. I mean, it's not even a second. So someone throws an EKG in front of my, in front of my eyes, and I'm sure you do the same way. You, you can know in a tenth of a second that this person has a STEMI when it's obvious like this. So this one doesn't even take a second to figure it out. Extensive anterolateral pattern. Up, J point, J point from here to here. V2, V3, V4, V5, V6, one AVL. Reciprocal ST depression here. So it's a no-brainer, right? No one's ever going to miss that, I don't think. Inferior wall. And uh, we talked about posterior infarction. The main thing is to not miss a right tier uh, RV infarction. So let me see something here. So it's mostly RCA, but who cares? 
uh, and the size of an RV infraction is really important. Why, why is RV infraction so important? It's never isolated. It's so important because these people are volume dependent. You give these people nitrates, pressure bombs out, and they die. These people need volume, right? So you have to know how to recognize it. I think I got a couple over here. So again, uh, this person, this is early. Some J point elevation here and here. No ST depression there. And this is evolving, so up in two, up in three, up in F. Doesn't look bad over here, but maybe a little bit of ST, ST depression there. So ST elevation two, three, and F. QA formation three and F. Reciprocal ST depression and AVL. So AVL is your, your, your reciprocal lead there, okay? So when you see this with this, you know it's acute. I want to get to an RV infarction. Again, it takes about a couple nanoseconds to know that's primarily inferiorly. And now you've also got not looking normal STs over there, but basically 2, 3, F, reciprocal AVL, a little bit 1, right? So elevation 2, 3, and F, reciprocal changes AVL. ST elevation is greater than lead 3. This is a minor point. But if ST elevation is greater than 3 than 2, that suggests an RCA inclusion associated with RV infarction. So if this is like this, greater than 3 than 2, worry about giving them enough volume, OK? And even better, if they have some, uh, some uh, changes, right ventricular infarction, really lead 1 Lead one looks right at the right, right ventricle. So you don't get it isolated. It's always within fear wall. And people with RV infarction are very preload sensitive and can develop severe hypotension in response to nitrates or other preload reducers. So hypotension, RV infarction, treated with fluid loading, and nitrates are contraindicated. So when do you suspect that? Uh, look, look at for anybody with an, with an inferior wall infarction, and the main thing is ST elevation of V1 and ST elevation greater than lead 3 than lead 2. So again, look at patterns. You can use right side of leads. So here you've got ST elevation 2, 3, F, but you also have this. And you also have ST elevation 3 is greater than 2, that's an obvious right ventricular infarction. These people need volume. Again, if you're not a doc, talk to your docs about this, although you may be able to be smarter than them than they are on this. So uh, same thing over here. And if you look at a right side of lead with V4, there's ST elevation there. And uh, no patterns, OK? So you should all know, need, Kenny, I need my, uh, or Zach? You need medical decision making slides here. You know, ask talk. So look at the PowerPoint slides. Learn EKG interpretation if you don't know it. And if uh, you feel uncomfortable with EKG interpretation, talk to your medical director or email me. I, I get some resources, OK? Very important as a mid level to know how to read an EKG. Not critical because you always have a doctor working with you, but why not? It's not hard and it's important. <laughs>